Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Rams Review Podcast. Today is another Rams Review Meets. I'm Corey, and joining me today is former Derby County defender, Newport County defender, um, Mark O'Brien. OB, how are we? Yeah, not too bad. Thanks, yourself. Yeah, not too bad. Not too bad. You know, um, the weather started to turn here, so it's just got a little bit too cold for my liking. Um, but I've only got <laughs> the one sweater on today, so, um, you know, it's not all in all too bad. How are you? Yeah, not too bad. Same down here in Wales. The weather's starting to turn, but I'm used to it now with the last three years of being here. So it's nothing different to what Ireland turns in anyway. <laughs> um, and so my first question, Mark, obviously, um, I, I, I want to address this, you know, how are you after your operation? Yeah, look, I'm, I'm, I'm much better now. Uh, obviously, I'm still taking things slow because like, I've not really got an end goal to kind of reach. I'm just trying to get some general fitness back for myself. But I started jogging last week and this week as well. So um, things have like progressed really well. And like I said, um, I've had the backing from the club and obviously a lot of other people around the place and people who have known me. Um, everything, is, everything is going according to plan and everything's going really well. Like, so I'm happy with the progress that has been made and I'm feeling a lot more comfortable now. Yeah, well, I saw that video of you... Um... Uh, do it. I think it was like a what it was like hundred meter jog. Uh, yeah, trying to be like Usain Bolt there. Um, but how did it feel for you to finally get back and get the legs moving and and start running again? Because it's obviously a very scary um, operation that you had with your heart. Yeah, like at at the time, like obviously I was a bit more anxious about getting back jogging. But I knew in the scenarios and situations that I'm in now, like I have to I have to get into the mind frame of I need to start pushing myself a bit more. And I need to get out of my comfort zone of just doing everything that keeps me calm. I have to start progressing myself. And um, like I say, the physio that I've been with, like obviously at Newport now, he um, he goes out for the jogs with me. And uh, like I say, like we take it slow where like my first jog, like I was jogging for like 45 seconds. I'd walk for five minutes and I'd do that continuous for a half an hour. And then only the other day, like I... I bumped it up to a jog for a minute and I'll walk for five minutes. So each time like we're kind of just chipping away at adding seconds to the jog and I'm hoping in in a couple of months time or whatever that I can kind of just do a continuous jog and everything kind of progress from there. But like I say, I've been lucky enough that with the support of the club that I've had um, for the fitness side of things that they, they've been amazing. And I was anxious at first, but once I kind of get past that hurdle of the first jog and now I can do it, um, it becomes a lot clearer and it gets easier as time goes on, but it's just the fitness side of things now that I kind of hold me back. Do you ever feel, do you ever feel, obviously you've been a professional athlete at, at a high level. Do you ever feel like, do you ever get frustrated with yourself? Cause I've always been curious with this sometimes because you go, I, I know I can do this. And obviously physically you can't because of the operation and everything like that. And you got to make sure all the things, but have you gotten past, because this isn't your first operation. Have you kind of got past the, okay, this is the frustration because I'm a, I'm a professional athlete. I should be at this level. And now it's just kind of, is it different because now you're kind of retired and you're like, I don't necessarily have to rush back to get to games. I have to look after myself for the next 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years, you know, longer term aspects. So does that give you a little bit more recovery time and help that frustration ease a little bit? It does help. It is, but also like, as you said, like for the last 10 years of my life from the very first operation, I've been used to 10 years of full flight fitness of playing a game on a Saturday training, Monday to Friday, going to the gym and doing all these different little things. And like you say, um, I think that's what kind of where I was being very hard on myself once I came out of hospital because when my head was feeling fine, my body wasn't letting me do what I wanted to do. And then it's like for the simple steps of like the only way you can put it is it's like you're a baby starting to walk again or you have to learn how to crawl first and then you have to learn how to walk and take a couple of steps and then those couple of steps turn into longer on your feet and that's just the way this operation went. But I think because when you've surrounded yourself for so long with football and you're on a time scale or you're on a structure and you have a regime of what you do day in, day out, monthly and stuff like that, I was getting really frustrated with myself. I was getting frustrated with the whole process. I was getting frustrated with everything. And um, sitting down talking with people um, kind of settled me on that because I had to start realizing I can't be so hard on myself because as much as I want to get back to fitness as soon as possible, it's it's a journey 
that I've been described it as that you need to go on where there's going to be times where I could do a jog one week and then next week the jog mightn't go quite as well. But I need to accept that and just push through those little barriers that are kind of holding me back. And like I say, the last couple of weeks now, I've I've been kind of pushing through those barriers and it's becoming a, a lot easier. But I think with football um, and that being your life and that like fitness is basically being your life and being so structured and strict with yourself, um, that has been like probably the most mentally challenging part because when your head feels fine and you wake up in the mornings and you think, oh, I'd love to go for a jog or I can't wait to go to the gym. Once I start the gym, I start the jog and I'm, and I'm not quite where I, I'm nowhere near where I used to be. It makes you really frustrated until you kind of, I sat down with the club doctor and like he just told me, like he said, look at it realistically. He said, like, you're taking 15 steps forward. And he said, you might only be taking five back, but he said, it probably feels as though you're taking 15 back. And he said, that's just the way the process and the journey goes. He said, and in, in realistic times, he said, you're four, four and a half, five months over open heart surgery. And I said, I understand all of that. But I said, it's just difficult to try and process it to where, like I say, five months previous, I was out cycling a bike constantly. And I was doing like two hours a day on a bike to then, doing 30 minutes on this on like a, a bike in a gym and I'm like so so tired or I'm feeling drained or I'm feeling everything and like you say I was just trying to get over them little hurdles but I'm I'm at the stage now where I've accepted all of that and this fitness is not for football where I've I've kind of made a little goal for myself to say I'm hoping like sometime after the new year going into the running at the end of the season I can get my boots back on and maybe be an outside man in training I'd just be able to kick a ball around again and not feel tired while I'm doing it and I said that's the kind of goal I want to push towards and like you say everybody in life wants to be fit and healthy and everybody but when that's that's all I've ever known is to try and be fit and healthy and um, feeling how I am now like everybody is trying to like convince me and say to me you're going you're, you're doing so well you're doing brilliant but to me personally I know I'm not in the shape I used to be so that's the frustrating part as well as I am doing or as well as I would be doing if I was the general public, for me personally, it's not where I want to be. And like I say, um, I've got loads of time to be able to progress on that. But obviously, when you come from football, you want it on the here and now, and you want to you want to wake up one morning and everything be back to normal. But unfortunately, things don't just happen that way. But it's been going okay. Like and like I say, uh, like I've I've had the support of everybody, so I can't really complain. Like I've I've come to terms with it all. Yeah, I can imagine that obviously you're not trying to get football fit. You're just trying to get, you know, life fit really, you know, and I can't for one ever say that I woke up in the day and said, I can't wait to go for a run. Uh, it's not ever, you know, I'm not necessarily a runner. I like to get my running in with football and kind of that hidden running kind of stuff. But before we talk about football, you know, you talked about it there a couple of times, the mental resilience, you know, how have you, how have you built up? Cause obviously, you know, you guys, you guys are in lockdown, right? Everyone's been in lockdown. We can't see our friends or our families or our loved ones and everything like that. And so it's put in a lot of mental pressure on a lot of different people and, and whatever. And so for you to come from, you know, the fitness that you were at in football and have, you've had some massive life changes over the past six or eight months. I think, you know, you've retired from the game. You've, you've had your second open heart surgery. We've had this lockdown and things like, so the life for you, I can imagine has changed significantly. So what have you, what tips do you have or how do you build up and, and keep that mental resilience to keep that, that spirit of, okay, yeah, it might be one, it might be 15 steps forward and five steps back, but tomorrow is going to be 15 steps forward and five steps back. And, and even if you take a knock to come back from that, how do you build that mental resilience? I think that comes all from the very first heart surgery that I had. Um, like being in football, like kind of, makes you mature and makes you grow up really quickly as 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 crazy as it sounds like 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 from me derby days like I was thrown into a force team at the age of 16 so I knew I had to grow up quickly but then like I say from 16 onwards I've always had that kind of love for football that nothing else mattered if I got injured I'll get back if I have the heart problem and they give me a chance to get back playing I'll get back and everything was always geared towards football and that's why this time has probably been that bit more mentally challenged than it probably has physically because I was only speaking to our club doctor and I was saying 
like I'm on the same track than I was when I was 16. Like after five months of the heart operation, when I was 16, I was back jogging five months later and progressed it that way. And I'm back jogging five months later now again. So I know I'm on the right track, but I think it's the fact of there's no end goal to get back to a football fitness. There's no end goal to get back and play on a Saturday. And the pandemic hasn't helped because then obviously you're walking around outside or I don't go out as much or you can't socialize as much. So that's going to help me back. So like there's, there's, there's been a lot to it, but don't get me wrong. Like the, the times after the operation, like I have found myself like really down and sometimes not wanting to get out of bed other times, not wanting to go watch football, not wanting to do anything because I've always felt as though, I was making excuses for myself. I was always making a lot of excuses. And the more excuses I made, the worse I felt. So, like, I'd make the excuse of saying, oh, well, it's raining out. I'm not going to go for my walk. Or the lads are playing away from home. I'm not going to go watch the game. Or, do you know what? I'm not going to go into training today. Or I'll do it tomorrow or I'll do it tomorrow. And I was finding myself doing that a lot. And it was when you start speaking to the professional people, because, like, as I said, I've had uh, my girlfriend say say things to me. I've had, like, my family say things to me. And they were saying exactly what a doctor was saying. But, I would, like, I was only just saying, well, they're saying it for the sake of it. But then when I have, like, a cardiac rehab team telling me, well, if it's raining, still go out and walk. If it's 40 minutes, it's 40 minutes done. And then once I kind of – once I had that structure back of what I knew I needed to do and what I had to do, like in a football scenario, I was able to progress myself and get so much better, so much better because they they would phone me once a week and say, Roy, for this week, I want you to walk 50 minutes every single night and you have to do it. So that's just like in football, if, if a physio or a fitness coach says, right, we're doing the gym five days this week, you have to do it. It's the only structure I've ever known. Somebody tell me what to do and I will go do it. So once I kind of had that guidance along the way, it kind of broke me out of my shell a bit and then I started to do it more. And then the more that I done, which is the craziest way, because normally you think like with injuries or operations, bed rest, relax yourself and get back fit, whatever. But with a heart, it's totally different. It's the more you do, the better you feel. Rather than when you sit down and do absolutely nothing, you feel worse. Because the way it's described to me is your heart is a muscle, just like any muscle in your legs or arms or whatever when you're trying you have to retrain your legs. You have to retrain your muscles. So your heart is no different. It's a muscle that you have to train again. So like I say, the more that I was doing and the structure that I had to follow made everything a lot easier. And, and that's, why we're, that's why I am where I am now because I got given that structure and now I get given more structures to say, right, well, this week we'll jog and then tomorrow you'll go to the gym and you do this. So when I know I have a program to follow, it makes me feel so much more comfortable and at home with everything because that's all I've ever been used to whereas when I first came out of hospital I was dealing with retiring I was dealing with not having football anymore I was dealing with a pandemic I was dealing with feeling terrible I was dealing with everything but never had a structure to know how to get out of it and once I got given that structure down the line um, a lot more of me panics and, and anxieties relaxed and calmed down where I knew what I was doing, I know where I'm going and that's the only thing that I ever needed and now that I seem to have that, I seem to be progressing so much better than I would have been if no one ever gave me that guidance. Do you feel, so you mentioned when you were 16 and I, I've got to pull up some pictures of you and you were a baby faced 16 yeah. year old Mark, uh, the, beard, the beard helps though, I like the beard. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, I remember obviously being a Derby supporter, you came through, you were a highly rated, uh, youth player at the Academy and you, and you came through and broke into the first team. And then I think you played what a, a few games and then it was, you know, Hey, you've done this heart check. You're going to need an operation. And I remember you were out obviously for, I think it was about a year, I think, uh, wasn't it with the first time you had it? Yeah. Um, it was, it was kind of like, I made the debut at the end of the season when I first signed at 16. So then the following season, um, I got the routine heart scan because I was able to sign for the club permanently then. And then I had the operation in October of that year. 
and then I got back playing by April. So I think I was about eight, nine months out. And that was like, obviously, if I didn't make my debut the season before, and I've said it before, like if I didn't make my debut then or if Nigel Clough wasn't the manager, like I don't even know if I probably would have had a career. So like you say, like things in the most positive way to try and look at it, like things do happen for reasons and things happen wherever cards you get dealt. <laughs> like you have to just kind of go with it. And that's something, like I say, I've learned from 16 onwards. And I'm not saying that I still sit here not trying to be negative sometimes and not overthinking things because I still do do that. But I think once I start feeling myself again, I know my kind of, ah, well, do you know what? I'll be okay. Because that's the kind of person I've always been through football. If I know I can get over this, I can do this. If I, if I know I can get over this, I'll, I'll, I'll get over the next one. But I just think because there was no structure leading up to all this, I never really thought, is this, is this me for the rest of my life? Going to feel terrible, going to feel drained, going to feel like I'm not fit anymore? Or am I going to get back to it? And now it's slowly getting back there. I can kind of start feeling myself more upbeat and I can feel everything getting better again. And like you say, at Derby... Like once I had that operation, it was kind of a hit or miss whether I'd ever get back again. But thankfully, I had the the right manager at the time who had like so much trust in me, and I was glad enough I made like some sort of impression from the season like prior to that that I got given that chance to get back fit again. So walk me through your debut. Um, what, what's Nigel Clough? I mean, obviously we don't have WhatsApp and stuff back then. Um, how does he come up to you and say, "Hey, Ob, you're, you're starting. You're starting this game to make your debut." And how did that happen? And then how did you feel pulling on that professional shirt for the first time? It, it was crazy because I remember that season when I came over. I was only 15, and I was training with the academy side, the under 18s. Um, but I had to play with the under 16s until I could fully register for the club at 16. So then, when it came to November time, and I turned 16, they were able to register me as a uh, schoolboy slash kind of youth team player. So then I started playing more games in the youth in the youth side, and I started to do okay. And um, I got a chance to play for the reserve side because one of the second year scholars at the time um, came down ill or got injured. So Clough put me on the bench, and I think we were playing Glen Huddle's academy in the training ground. And I was on the bench, and I got the last ten minutes. So. I came on and I was throwing myself in front of like shots to block everything and I was just excited to be on the par- on, on the pitch. So within that 10 minutes, Clough already said, oh, you've done okay when you came on. So then that kind of led to getting another chance with the reserves and it led to getting another chance with the reserves. And it was the second last, it was the second last week before the season finished and we were playing Sheffield United in the, in the, youth, in the youth team. And my parents were over. And uh, they were standing on the top of the hill watching down in Moor Farm, watching onto the pitch and watching us play. And um, at the end of the game, my dad was like, oh, Nigel Clough was over talking to us. He's a lovely fellow, whatever. I was like, oh, yeah, that's good. So then we ended up going to the first team game. Derby won 2-1. I think it was Doncaster at home. I'm not too sure. But Derby won 2-1. So then after the game, there was obviously one more week left the season finishes. I go home back to Dublin. So then... When, I, when my mum and uh, dad were going to the uh, airport, like I gave them a hug and stuff like that. And I said, right, I said, I'll be home by next week. I said, like, or the week after the season finishes. And my dad said to me, oh, no, I'll see you next week. And I said, why would you come back over next week? I said, the season's finished. And he said, you're on the fourth team bench next week. And I said, no, I'm not. <laughs> he said, yeah. He said, Nigel was, like, because my dad would always say to me, he goes, Nigel was talking to me. And he said, you're on the bench next week. So that's me just thinking, my dad's trying to wind me up because I was still only 16. So I was like, no chance. So then we went into training on the Monday. I'm in the U team changing room and I'm putting on my boots. And uh, I think it was Gary Crosby came up to the changing room and goes, I'll be here with us today. And I was kind of like, you start feeling like panic, nerves, your face goes white. You're thinking, what do I do now? So I went down and I trained with the force team and, and the one thing that, like, they've always said about me, and most people do, like, like from 16 onwards, I was always a talker on the pitch. Like, I was always trying to organise, and 
I'd have a go at people. I'd be talking to people like once I was on a pitch. So when I went down training with the force team, like I kind of switched into like football mode and I was talking to everybody and I was telling someone, drop back in, push here, do this. And that's something that they always said caught their eye. For a 16-year-old to be able to do something like that is what they thought was like a great thing. And they saw and they knew that I loved to defend. And then I come in and we were having lunch after the Monday session, all the uh, the U team lads, what was it like in training today? So then I have all the force team lads coming over, pat me on the back, saying how great I was in training and you were man of the match in training if there was an award getting given out. So I was kind of feeling like on cloud nine thing, and this is amazing. And like I said, I'll never forget that week. So that whole week I trained with the force team. And then I think it was the Friday or the Thursday we had, I think it was the Thursday night we had the like the end of season awards. And I remember like you like you come in and you sit down at the tables and I remember like Nigel saying to me, You up for the game this weekend? And I goes, Yeah, we're playing so and so, I think, with the youth team. And he was like, No, what for the way? And he goes, Cause you're with us this weekend. And then that's when I kind of thought, Oh no. Like like excited but thinking, Oh my god, here we go. So then on the Saturday, I remember traveling down with the force team and like I'm sitting on the same table as the likes of Rob Hulse and people like that and don't speak a word to anybody. And that's what I was always saying. Like, I never spoke to anybody off the pitch because like I was like, I was always the quiet one. I'd never spoke but on the, on the pitch. I'd be a talker. So we go down to the changing room and like the team gets put up. So then I'm on the bench and uh, the game goes on and Derby were 3-0 down at the time. And it was Rob Holtz and Lou and Noyatanga playing centre back together. So it goes to half time. And then we come back out, and I'm sitting there on the bench. And then one of the other players, I think it was Mark Dudley, who was sitting next to me, he looked over Andy Garner's shoulder and said, You're coming on after 60 minutes. And I kind of looked at him and said, Nah, you're joking. And then I looked up at the clock, and I seen like it was like 57, 58 minutes gone. And Andy Garner, oh, be get warm. So then get warm like I've never done it before so I'm just jogging up and down the sideline like nervous as can be like at Vicarage Road like and it's what well, it was like I think there was 22,000 people at it and I'm jogging up and down doing me stretches but not really knowing what I'm doing and then I got cut and then I got called to come on and I think it was I came on for Lou and Noyatanga and just before I went on Clough his words to me were kick it and head it be a defender defend and that was all he said to me. So I just went on and any ball that came to me, I would head it. Anything that came to me, I would clear it. And even in that instance, like Robbie Savage was brilliant with me. Anything I'd done well came over, patted me on the back. Well done, OB. Brilliant. Rob Hulse, when I came onto the park, was like, right. He said, you're the centre-back here. You tell me what to do. So I'm coming on to like a four-team game thinking, what is going on here? So like everything went in my favour. Like I won me tackles, won me headers, cleared one off the line and the game finished 3-1 and like everyone was delighted for me and everything like it just felt like that was the moment where I was like this is why I want to play football this is why I moved away and like you say like I was probably lucky enough that I got that chance to do that because obviously what followed that was the hard stuff and Clough already seen enough in me at the time to give me that opportunity and like I say if, probably if it wasn't for him as manager or whatever like I, I probably wouldn't have been able to progress my career. I know what a manager probably would have gave me that opportunity. So there's a lot that it comes down to. But that debut, like it is hazy. But I remember like some of the good bits from it as well. Like I'd love to be able to watch it back one day. But I, I, I don't think they done DVDs back then. <laughs> I saw you put the, you posted the clip the other day of you um, doing an old fashioned, I guess, Nigel Clough defending, where you guy chases you down, you flick it over his head, and you control it like you know, I guess like Ronaldo would do. I mean, I guess that got some plots yeah. in the dressing room, but um, talk to me about Nigel Clough. Um, like you say, you know, he's giving you your opportunity. You're speaking very highly of him. You know, what was he like in the dressing room? What were the training sessions like and things like that, that we might not necessarily understand? Like, uh, like I know a lot of people have like divided like opinions on what he was like, but I, like for me personally, as a man and as a, as a manager, he kind of made me the player that I was. Like I, like, I always loved to defend and I always loved to, like, throw my head in and make tackles and, like, be a defender. But he, he allowed me 
to in a way perfect that in a forced team environment like he he gave me the opportunity he stayed loyal towards me um when i went through some difficult times with different injuries he always stood by me and gave me that opportunity to get back fit and like i say as a as a person himself when i was going through the forced heart operation when i was back in ireland for three months he was phoning me nearly every second day and um, making sure I was going out doing my long distance walk and making sure I was doing everything properly, making sure I was okay. And even even after this operation now, this is 10 years down the line, he phoned me to see how I was getting on with this operation and how everything is. And if I ever need any hand, if I ever need any help or anything, or if I ever need, need to talk. And for me, like, I always see it as like nobody ever has to do stuff like that. And like, I've had like a lot of people help me out, but I've always said it, if it wasn't for him as the manager at the time and the character, like the, the personality that he is and the loyalties that he has, he's the, the kind of manager that is, if you do well by him and you work hard for him and you listen, he will like be loyal back and he will trust in you and he'll give you the benefit of the doubt and he'll give you opportunities. And, if it wasn't for him, I probably wouldn't have had a career because I don't know if there's any other managers or any other clubs that would stick by players maybe through all this as a 16-year-old where they could just end up paying you up all my wages and say, right, we'll help you back to fitness, but we're not going to give you the opportunity. And he was a manager that stuck by me through everything. And like I say, there's a lot that I owe towards him and Derby as a club. And that's why it's always a club that's like so close to my heart because it's somewhere that I loved playing. But also, if it wasn't for them picking up on certain things, like you always say, like what if, what could have happened, what might have happened, and um, yeah, like I'm lucky, and like it's training sessions where he likes you to train as you play. So if that means throwing in hard tackles, and that means high intensity, if that means like um, putting your bodies on the line and training, they were the kind of things that he always wanted. But all he wanted was just honest hard work. If you were an honest player that wanted to work hard and you had like technical ability, he would stick by you through anything. He would like, and they're the kind of characters he was always after. So sometimes you see when he's gone on to do different jobs, he always brought the players he knew he could trust in that had great character. There was the Stephen Boywater, Sean Barkers, Jake Buxton, John Brayfords, all these players that he knew he could trust in. He would take anywhere with them. And it's the same with his coaching staff. And, I think that's what he probably seen within me that he stuck by me through it all. And like I say, if it wasn't for him, then my career might have never even have taken off or even happened. Yeah, it's funny you mentioned some of those names there because that was kind of my next question. Like you've read my questions ahead of time. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, when, when you were at Derby, you were at some, I call them pretty decent names, pretty big names of the recent past. You know, Sean Barker, Jason Shackle, Jake Buxton, Craig Bryce, and Robbie Savage. Um, how are those senior pros with you? You know, obviously you said, you know, Savage came over and was patting you on the, on the head and, and giving you kudos and stuff for that great performance against Watford. But what were they like in the dressing room as, as professionals and what did you learn off of, off of them? You learn a lot. Like, in a way, like, I know, it's, I know it's very old school now, but normally, like, when you're sick, when you're 15, 16 and you're around the force team and you're the young player, you're, like, the tea boy, you make teas, whatever a force team player says or wants, you just go do and you don't speak back. So Robbie Savage was my kind of insight to that. And because he said he liked me as a player, he probably treated me the toughest. So like I could be walking down the corridor and he would say, oh, I'll have two sugars, OB. So I'd walk back and go, I'm not going to the canteen. And he'd go, oh yeah, but I'll have a tea. So you go make him a cup of tea. So it's like kind of earning your trade really where it's like the old school ways of if you if you clean a professional or, an, or a player's boots, it's the sign of respect that that's what I want to be and what you want to aspire to. So if you want someone making teas for you, establish yourself, work hard. And there's a lot of people along the way, like Craig Bryson, like he was brilliant. Like he was a fitness freak and I used to try and do some like um, treadmills running with him and there's no way on hell I could keep up with him, but he was brilliant where you could see, like, someone who worked hard. Um, Sean Barker for his defending. Like, he's somebody that, even from the stands when you're watching him, puts his body on the line, wins his headers, wins his tackles. He's an honest player. 
and he's somebody that I was able to look at as a defender and go, well, do you know what? Like, that's that's the way I like to defend. Or that's the way I want to defend. And I want to do that in a force team, like the way he's doing it. And Jake Buxton as a professional, like, there are all these kind of people that are normal, genuine people that there's no thrills about them. There's no flashiness. There's no big cars, big this. They were always just, right, work hard for the badge, play well, work hard for the team. And like they were real team players and leaders that would drag a team through a game or drag a team through a performance. And um, as well as that, like you say, there's, there's, there's all these different names. And the things that you learn from these people, like there's a different way, like even with Jason Shackle. Jason Shackle was more of a football inside the centre-back, so I knew I had to try and adapt to be better on the ball. And he was someone that you look at and go, right, he steps out and he's better on the ball and does these little things. So there's a lot you try and take from a lot of different people. And as well as that, still try and not lose what the manager wants me in there for and still try and be me. But along the way, there's, there's, all, there's all sorts of ways where they try and help you. It's, it's even the same where if Clough used to sometimes come down hard on me as an 18-year-old, like it would take someone like Sean Barker, Jake Buxton, who would pull me to the side and say, the reason he's coming down hard on you is because he wants the best for you. He wants you to improve. So he said, the more he's getting onto you and wanting you to improve and wanting you to do better, it might seem as harsh criticism, but that's because he believes in you. Whereas they said to me, if he doesn't want to talk to you and doesn't give you the time of day, that's when you should worry because that's when he doesn't have any interest in you. So then when, once you get that explained to you, everything you see everything different in your head. You start saying, well, bro, you, he's telling me to do things. And he might be saying it in a harsh way where I think he's having a go at me here. But that's once they explain things like that to you and they're the older pros that explain it, you kind of look at it and say, oh, well, I understand it now. And now years down the line, when I was looking to be the experienced one in a squad, like at Newport and places like that, you try and do the same to other lads. And when you hear them like complain about a manager or a player being on them, you try and turn around and say to them, well, the reason people are this hard on you is because they know you're better than what you're doing right now. It's when they don't care and don't want to criticise you and they just let you do what you want to do. They're the times you need to kind of look at yourself and say, well, why isn't he speaking to me? And that's that That was one of the big eye-openers that I had. And Like, I was lucky enough, and it's the same, like, with Jeff Hendrick and people like that. Like, I've known him my whole life. I've known him since we're, like, 10 years old. So to be able to, like, be in the same team as the likes of him, there's Johnny Russells, Jamie Ward, Theo Robinson, like, we had a really good unit together and we had a really good squad and everybody got along with everybody. And like you say, it was it was one of them where it was a changing room where there were like there were a lot of like there was a lot of talent in it, but it was a it was an honest bunch that would play for the badge and play for the fans. And that's why there was such a good feel good factor around the place. And sometimes results weren't going great. But the fans always backed us because they could see we were giving everything for the club. And that's one thing, like you say, you can always take away from there that when I did have me time to play and I and I was there, like the response that I had from Derby fans since like my retirement have been amazing because they knew that all I wanted to do was give 100% for the club. And for me to be able to get that across to them by how I play it, like I, 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 I was like, I was blown away by the response I got from every last one of them. Yeah, because I remember when the news broke of your of your injury, um and whatever and i remember sitting there thinking i know he's not played a f you know too many games at the time for derby but i was like he's gonna be a big loss and i remember that and i think a, a lot of people felt that too like you'd, you'd made such a big impact in such a short amount of time in kind of the hearts and minds of derby fans which is kind of difficult to do in football you, you know how you know derby fans are probably yeah. the most patient group of fans in the history of football right they don't they they give everybody a fair shake but to to sit back and, and to say wow you know he's gonna be out for a year He's pretty good, and you were such you were such a young person at the time. I mean, I sit back and I think about what I was doing at sixteen, and it wasn't playing, it wasn't playing men's yeah. football, you know, at a high level to put food on the table. And do you think that having started so early that it helped it helped you mature a lot more as as a person and as an individual and as a man? Like, did you have to grow up a lot more because all of a sudden you're sitting in a dressing room with Robbie Savage? You can't just do what a normal sixteen year old would want to do. You know what I mean? You, you have to be like, okay. 
I'm a professional. I'm in with this senior group of players and I have to be a little bit more mature beyond my years. Yeah, and, and, and that's one thing that like hit me really hard is that like normally when you're 16 and you're away in a youth, in a youth system, you get your Christmases off, you get to go home to Ireland for your Christmas. But because of I was in a force team by 16, 17, that hit me really hard not to be able to see your family over Christmas and not really be able to do things because you'd be training on a Christmas day, you'd be playing on a boxing day. And it did make me grow up really quickly. And But it made me grow up for the better because, like you say, from the heart operation onwards, it made me a lot more mature to see things in a bigger picture, to see things. And don't get me wrong, look, I made mistakes along the way and there's been loads of times I've made mistakes along the way where, yeah, I'm in a changing room with Robbie Savage and I'm seen as a professional footballer, but it, it comes through to social media at the time. Like, I would write something on social media because one or two of the youth team lads, like, are taking the piss about something that, like I've said, are they trying to say something about Ireland as a, as a country and football and I'd say something about England but it's all it's all over social media so when that's over social media and then all of a sudden I see negative com comments coming at me where I'm trying to have a joke and a laugh to what I would do as a 16 year old on the internet but then I had to be reined in a bit to go no you're in the public eye now this is something you're going to have to learn like you're seen as a professional footballer now you're not seen as a 16 year old from Ireland whereas a 16-year-old in Ireland could write whatever he wants on the internet and nobody will take notice. Whereas I'm part of a force team, now I'm part of a football club and what I say gets read a lot by a lot of people and some people may take offence and some people don't. And that was a big eye-opener for me there and then to kind of think a lot of people gave me a lot of leeway at the beginning for it to say he's only 16, give him a break, he will learn. And then that's where like you say, them little moments mature you to go, right, hang on, I need to be careful what I say here. I, I, I can't just say what I want anymore. Or when you're in a changing room, you still have to respect your elders. You have to respect the, um, the older pros. You respect everybody. So then the whole discipline and respect side comes from, from that to where I could be going on an away trip and I might be 19th man and not even make the bench or I might even be playing. But I'm on the coach and I'm making 100 cups of teas for the whole four hours. So where everybody else might get their head down and have a sleep, I'm getting tapped on the shoulder, right, we'll have another round of teas. And they're like little things to go, right, well, if you want to establish yourself and then you make it into a force team, there's going to be another young lad that he'll make the tease and you're going to be the professional then that doesn't have to do this. But you have to kind of earn your way in or earn your respect in that way. And it, it, like I say, it, it was, I was glad I came up in the changing room that I did because it did mature me. And it made me see things a lot better where I had, as some people described before, I had an old head on young shoulders. So from like 16, 17, 18, I was a lot more mature for an 18-year-old than what some people would be in a normal day-to-day -day basis as an 18-year-old because I was seen in the public eye. I was playing week in, week out for Derby. I was playing in the championship. There was people speaking about me. I was getting called up for like Ireland squads even though I was injured at the time. So that's when times kind of hit you where you think, well, you know what, you have to grow up quicker because I'm living away from home. I'm having to fend for myself. I was living in my first ever apartment at 18 and like you don't li you don't have like your family home that you can just easily drop over to like they're all back in Ireland so you do have to like learn how to fend for yourself and live for yourself um early early on in your career but like I said it it put me in good stead for everything that like was to progress in my career and everything that went on but like I said at the beginning that's why Derby has held so one, it helped me start the career. They stuck by me to help me progress my career. And it kind of made me the player that I was and that I have been for the last 10, 11 years of, of, of my career playing. Yeah, I mean, you, I mean, it's like when you move into your first house and, and obviously you were, you know, a distance away as well and you close that door and that's it. You know, if you don't want to eat, that's on you and that kind of thing. And it does, it yeah. does add a maturity level because you realize like, 
you don't have that safety net of your parents or your brothers or your sisters or your friends that you can go out with and things like that. And so I can imagine it can be very isolated. And I just wanted to ask Mark before we move on to two more questions. One, what do you think would have happened to you if you had told Robbie Savage to get his own cup of tea? Would we be talking right <laughs> if now? I, if, if, if I had to tell Robbie Savage to get his own cup of tea, I, I doubt I would have played in Derby's first team. Uh, he was somebody who, like, if, it, like, the, the thing with Robbie Savage is, if he was to, like, be constantly bantering you and constantly, like, slagging you off and on your back all the time, it meant he liked you and he was trying to, in a way, toughen you up. So, like, like I say, if I had to go make him a cup of tea, there was a time where I brought it to him, he pour half of it out in front of me and then say, oh, will you clean that up for me? I just spilled a bit. And then he'd go, oh, this is still a bit cold. Will you go down, make me another one because this cup is half full. So, like, all little things like that, you know he means it as a joke. And at the time, you're thinking, oh, just do it yourself. But you know it's Robbie Savage. He's played in the Premier League. Respect your teammates. And it's all stuff like that that, like, as you say, it builds your character. And then when he starts to see, like, one of the things he said to me before was, stick by me. And he said, like, I'll look after you. So, like, if anything ever went wrong, so when I went into a forced team scenario, I went onto the pitch. He was the first person to come over, congratulate me. He was the first person to say, well done. He was the first person to give me that boost. Whereas I'm sure if I didn't kind of do what I, do what I was supposed to do as a younger lad and respect him, I probably never would have played. I probably never would have, have had the pat on the back that he gave me or I would have never had that confidence boost that he gave me while I was playing so like you say it does all work your way where you do have to kind of earn your keep you do have to earn their respect so if they ask you to do some earn the respect do it for them don't like I always said like don't don't like look at it in a sense of saying oh these are bullying me these, like they're just trying to build character to see what kind of person you are that when push comes to shove and you do play in a force team with them, they know the person you are and they will look after you. And, 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 and that's what happened to me. And like I said, I was lucky enough that they did look after me. I mean, yeah, it's got to be kind of, if we, if, we, if we trust him off the field and he comes on, then we know, we know what type of person he is. So we can trust him on the pitch. Like, I know I don't have to go and cover obi has got that because I know, I know what kind of character he is. I know he's yeah. going to go and he's going to do that. And that obviously has got to help your team, I would assume. Um, what other memories stand out from Derby before we move on to before we move on to, to a few of our other teams that you were were a part of? What other memories other than your debut and that kind of stuff kind of stand out for Derby? Um, what stands out is just the club in itself because when I was there, it was very we were all we, we were so close to the fans. It was like the fans and players all got along. Everybody loved the squad we had, and we all loved the fans turning out in forty three thousand and. Like you say, it, 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 like the, me, me memories are there. Like the staff that we had, like we had, like the um, the woman who worked in the kitchen, Phyllis. She was off. Like she was, she was amazing. Like she was like the first person who was like one of the most warming people. And you'd walk in, and she'd give you a hug, and how was everything? And she was like kind of like somebody would be like, oh, how was everything? Have you spoken to your parents? And she would like look out for you, and and then as well as that. Like I said, the games that I played in, like I'll, I'll never forget me very first sold out Derby Stadium. We played Southampton at home and it was just going into the international break where we were joint top of the league with Southampton. And then there was a packed out, um, there was a packed out uh, Pride Park of like 23 and a half, 34,000 people. And I remember that. I'll never forget when we beat Nottingham Forest with 10 men and that whole atmosphere of that game, it was my very first local derby and that was amazing. And, just all little things like that picked up along the way. And then the squad of players that we had, like it, it was just one of the best times in my career that like if I could have had longer there, I would have loved it. But then football is that kind of business. You move on and you, you get on with your career. But it's, it's a place where, it's a place that matured me and grew me up really quick. And I loved every minute of it. And it's a place that like, as I've always said, is will always be close to me. And those memories of, training ground and uh, like the games that I played in like my first ever home debut against Birmingham and 
like just all different little things like that like just loved every minute of it and loved everybody who worked there and all the players staffed a lot and it was just a really tight-knit group that I always enjoyed being at. Yeah, it always struck me because I, I, when I travel to Derby every year to, to watch some games, you know, is just the how close the fans are to the players, right? I mean, when you look here at American sports, players are driven under the stadium. You can't get near them. You know, maybe they send somebody out once a week to sign autographs or whatever. But at Derby, you come out the ground and you can literally just stand there at the player's exit while you guys are coming out of the player's entrance and say, hey, can I get a selfie? And I'm a bit ashamed to say at my age, I'm just a few years older than you, Mark, but, you know, taking selfies with other, you know, it's starting to get, I shouldn't be doing yeah. it, but I turned into a complete fanboy and I'm okay with that. I'm yeah. okay with my, I'm, I'm okay with it. But, you know, the ability to come and say, Hey, you know, and, and, and talk to people about their families and say, Hey Mark, you know, how's your girlfriend or, you know, how, how's life going on? You know, do you like Nando's or whatever? And those kind of things, yeah. it, it's a really cool, it's a really cool thing that Darby have where you can kind of come out and, and mingle with the players as well. And not many places, not many other sports teams or organ uh, leagues or anything like that have that kind of interaction. And so I, f from a fan perspective, I think it's really cool. So it's cool to hear from a, from a player perspective as well, that you guys get a lot out of that as well. Um, so moving on from Derby, you went to, to Motherwell in Scotland. Um, what was that experience north of the border? Um, like I really enjoy that. Uh, like I went up there, Stuart McCall was the manager and I did really enjoy it up there then. Um, I done okay in the first couple of months and then I remember they had a manager change over, Stuart McCall left and uh, Ian Barraclough came in and Ian Barraclough wanted his own style of play and wanted his own players up there and wanted to like change everything over and like we had a great, <coughs> we had a great bunch of lads again and like loved everyone who was in that changing room like everybody was like so great to get on with like the minute I went up there like everyone was so welcoming and like the lads all had a good laugh and like it was a, it was a, it was a good a good squad of players and like you say um once Ian Barraclough came in and he wanted his way and his way only and he started bringing players up from like it was like he started bringing up like young players 18 19 year olds from down in England, taking them on loan and um, putting them in. And I remember he dropped me out of the team for a while and uh, he never really had a valid excuse for dropping me out of squad or out of the team because he obviously, me as a centre-back, I was never the tallest centre-back in the world and a lot of people have always said that about me. But also, I think... Um, because I'm, I wasn't the tallest centre back in the world. He was somebody that turned around and said to me, "Well, I'm looking for a centre back who looks like he has a bit more, um, a bit more stature about him, a bit more work, uh, like who looks a bit more physical." And I and I asked him out straight. I just said it to him. I said, "Well, I said, have I been like have I been beaten for a header?" And he said, "No." I said, "Have I have I been beaten in a tackle?" He said, "No." I said, "Has anyone run past me or beat me for pace?" And he said, no. And I said, so what's the reason? And he said, I'm just going to go with him because he just looks more physical. And I said, fair enough. And like you say, you kind of have your down times then when like, it's, like I'm, I'm in a new team or it's coming here to the end of the season and you're on a relegation battle and you want them to be playing and the manager doesn't quite fancy you. So that was my first taste of and different scenarios of different managers where they don't have the loyalties towards you, where they don't have the loyalties towards anything. They want things their way. And you just have to kind of bite the bullet and you just have to get on with it, really. And, and things didn't quite work out there. And, 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 and that was the end of it. But like I say, I enjoyed Scottish football. It was, it was an eye-opener to... You don't really hear much about it because all you know of is Celtic and Rangers. So when you play there you realise there's so much more talent and there's so much more competitive up there than what people give it give it credit for and I was happy at the experience of playing up there and I met some great people. And then you move from there to, to Luton um, and then you go from Luton on, on loan to Southport. What, what were those experiences like and what was it like dropping into the non-league? Um, like Luton, Luton, like I didn't know what to expect really because I didn't know anybody who was there. Normally, like, you know of one or two players that you might be signing with where you can kind of get an insight to what the place is like. But I hadn't got a, I didn't know anybody who was there. 
So when I signed, um, John Still as the manager, he was signing a lot of first team players. I think he made 12 or 14 signings that summer. So it was a really big squad. So you knew it was either going to be you play or you play in a cup game. And it, there was going to be a lot of moving around and a lot of like changing the squad every couple of weeks. So I was happy and like I was enjoying my time there. And I played a couple of games here and there. That one or two didn't quite go well. One or two did go well. But the squad was that big. You never really could get that much of a run. And then Nathan Jones came in and again... It was unfortunate that new manager, new ideas. I was a John Still player. I wasn't a Nathan Jones player. And, like, I've said it before that, like, I'm not really one that holds grudges against people or I'm never one that say that I've fallen out with a manager or I'll cause an, ups- uh, like I'll cause an uproar and I'll be upset about everything. But when I was the only player that didn't get any minutes under Nathan Jones... And like everyone else had a fair crack to kind of see what he had in his ranks to see if they were able to play or not. And when I was the only player that never got that opportunity to play, and if I had a messed up my own opportunity, it falls on my shoulders and I can accept that. But when you don't get given that opportunity to play and you're getting told that you need to move on, I was always kind of stuck in the middle to say, well, how come I didn't get given that opportunity to what everyone else did? Like, what is it about me that you don't like? And I like, as me and him kind of went back and forward, he was just saying it's a business. It's it's something that I want to bring in other centre backs, and you can you can totally understand the manager's reasoning for it. But also, you don't understand that as a player's perspective to say, well, give me my opportunity, and if I do well, but then there's no reason why you can't play me. But at least give me the opportunity. And because I ne- never got given that opportunity, I was kind of a, a bit sour about it. So his words to me were, go out on loan for a month get a couple of games under your belt, at least you'll be fit and you can keep yourself going and like I could end up having potential of getting me chance. So I went out on loan to Southport and that was an experience in a scene non league for what it is. Like everybody is playing for a wage. Some people have part time jobs and it kinda of gave me an eye opener to kinda of think to myself, Roy I like in, in in the best respect possible, it's it's something where I'm, I'm in a good position now with Luton. and I don't want to drop myself down to non-league because I feel as though I've got more to me than getting a second job. But I loved playing at Southport. Like Dino Marmaria gave me the opportunity, and like like I've said it to everybody. Like at the end of the day, it was a game of football. I like moved away from Ireland at 15 to play football. So if they wanted me to play, I was going to give it me all for Southport. Like. I'm not one of these to kind of judge people on the standard they play and think, oh, well, I'm never going to play there. Like, I enjoyed my time there and I loved playing at Southport and I enjoyed getting back to playing football again. And Dino Marmaria played me for seven games straight um, in a month. And then I got back to Luton and uh, things didn't quite work out again. I got me fitness. There were centre-backs injured and I thought, I've got me opportunity now. Like, I've done well at Southport. Um the manager got the report that I was doing really well. So hopefully I get me opportunity now. And I was 19th man away at Carlisle. I was 19th man traveling to Hartlepool. And I just thought to myself, this isn't working out. And um, the following season got me squad number taken away from me. I was training with the under 18s. And like you say, it, it's just one, of, it's just these other times in your career that are all different experiences. Like none of them are ever always going to be amazing. And, because I'm never a player that like throws his time, uh, throws throws his toys out of out of pram, and I sit there and I I sit and sulk. I just thought, right, well, I'm gonna keep training with the under 18s, and if someone got injured for the force team, he would call me over to train with the force team. I gave it me all in them sessions, and in his like his defense, he said it to me. He said, well, he said, look, you're in training like every single day. He said the reason you're allowed around all the force team is because and um, you're doing everything properly. You're not a bad egg, as they call it in football. You're not someone who's going to disrupt the change room. And I said, well, I'm not about that. I just want to be given a fair chance. So, as you say, I just kept my head down, kept working, and just hoped for that one opportunity of maybe playing at Luton or uh, maybe getting a chance of moving on. And because I heard that Dino Marmaria ended up going to Newport, um, when January came, I ended up getting in touch with him 
and asked if there's an opportunity of getting me to Newport and he said leave it with him and like you say from that on in um, I was lucky enough to be able to get to Newport then and then everything that came from that is, has been one big story in itself. Yeah, I want to talk about Newport because you're in Newport now. You've got a Newport County training top on. And so I'm going to make the assumption here and, and say, when you think of Newport, you think of home. Am I right? Yeah, like the, the closest thing that, I've, that like, I've, I've said to a lot of people now is the reason why I've been so happy here is because it's the only place since Derby I've felt at home. Like other places ha- like could have felt like home, but I was always moving around so much that I was never able to nail down a place where I thought, I'm going to get a run of games here, everything's going to go well. Whereas at Newport, I felt as though the fan base like took me in really well. The club took me in really well. And like I say, when you're happy where you're playing and you're getting the respect from the manager, you're getting the respect from the fans and you're getting all this respect and like love towards you you play like your best football and you feel your most comfortable. And, and, and that's what I felt here. And that's why everything went so well for me. And you have a, you have a, I think you play over 130 games for Newport County, which is a massive achievement in and of itself. And not only playing, you were captain of Newport County and you led your team out, you led your team out at Wembley. Um, what's, what's the feeling? What's, how much pride did you feel in that? Oh, like it, it was like, I, I found massive pride in that. Like, um, how that season went in itself. Like I was able to lead the team out at Middlesbrough in the FA Cup against Manchester City in an FA Cup. And to be the club captain or to be the on-the-field captain because we had Andrew Croft at the time who was the club captain. And he was amazing. He was brilliant. Like as, as a captain, he was a great leader. And I was glad I was able to try and be that leader on a pitch where I was able to be the voice on the pitch and organise and throw your head in and try and lead the right way. And to be able to say that I walked the team out at Wembley, um, to me was a great achievement. And like like I say, like everything that comes back in my career is all as great as it is. It, like just it's all personal achievements for me because it's stuff that I got told might never happen. And it was stuff from such a young age that I got told you might never have a career, you might never get back to professional, you might never do this and never do that. And all right before me, I was able to achieve all that. That now that I look at it and say, like, yeah, I've played at Wembley and yeah, I've done these things. Like, like I say, I just took massive pride to be able to, and like the group of lads that we had in the changing room at the time, like any one of them could have been a captain. Like every single man for themselves going into the end of that season, all could have been a captain and stood tall. So for me to be picked out as the captain of that group of of like players that we that we had, it was a massive achievement in itself, and like I, I loved every minute of it. Did you ever have a period of time where you're on that Wembley pitch, either during a warm up or at the end of the game, and you just look out with the fans in the stadium, and you just think about the journey that you've come from from Dublin at 15? You you know you were told if you don't get this operation, you you might not even have a career. You know from playing at Motherwell and being out of favor to go into to. To, to Luton and not getting a, a fair shake, to, to go into Southport in the non-league. I mean, d- did you ever have a moment where you kind of reminisced on the, not obviously during the game, but in the warm-up or something, and you sit there at Wembley and you go, this, this, is, this is special, like um, I've achieved what I needed to achieve, you know? Yeah, like there was, there was, don't get me wrong, there was so much more. Like obviously I would have loved to achieve in my career. I would have loved to play for my country. I would have loved to like, go back to the likes of those derby days and stuff but I knew for myself with the cards that were dealt with me I was doing the best I could personally do with everything that was getting thrown at me and like you say I think it was more of the build up to Wembley was more of the reminiscent side of things like the build up the staying overnight they were games that I've always dreamt of being involved in you see people walking out at Wembley or you see people play in a payoff final. It goes back to when I scored that goal in the 89th minute and it was a goal that saved the team from relegation. It was a goal. Like, I've always dreamt of these things. So, for when they... So, like, to know that, like, stuff like that has happened. So, like, I'm in the hotel, like, the day before a game and you've got all your suit ready and you've got everything ready and you're thinking... You look out your hotel window and Wembley's outside and you're thinking, I'm playing there. 
And like all these little moments, like they do come into your head and you start thinking, it was only two years ago, I was like non-league for a month on loan. There was only a year ago, I wasn't even, like I was training with an under-18 side in Luton because the manager didn't want me. And then a couple of years later, you're finding yourself walking out at Wembley in the League 2 playoff final. And like it does, it does make you appreciate so much but like I was never somebody who ever spoke openly about it until me retirement because I always seen my position of what I've had as a privilege and, I, and in my mind I was always saying well there's a lot more worse out there there's people that would like love to be in my position so like for me to try and come out at the time and speak about saying well look where I've been through and look where I am right now would have felt like I would have felt wrong of me. Like I never, like I've always said, I never wanted people to pity me or I never wanted people to treat me in a nicer way because I've had a heart operation. I wanted to be treated as Mark O'Brien, the footballer, give me a fair shout, just like every other footballer, but I don't want to be treated differently. And the fact I was able to achieve that, let alone anything else, was probably a bigger, more achievement to me than anything that I've ever been through because... Like I said, I had Stuart McCall text me after my operation and say, I didn't know you had to get a heart scan every single year to see if you could play year to year. And he was a manager who signed me at Motherwell. So if he was able not to understand that or not know that side of things, I must have been doing something right where I was getting judged personally on only me talent, which is all I ever wanted. So if my talent wasn't good enough, fine, you can hold your hands up and say, right, I wasn't good enough but I didn't want to not be signed for a team on the back of me health issues if I was good enough. I would rather a manager tell me, you're good enough to play, so we're going to play it, or you're not good enough to play. But I'd rather someone say, or I'd rather someone not say, like, oh, yeah, you're, you're brilliant, you're great enough to play here, but I'm not going to sign you because you've, got, you've had troubles in the past, and that's something that I never wanted. So that's why like, I never spoke about any of me issues that I've had or that's why I always kind of kept it to myself if I felt anxious or I kept it to myself about all my heart problems because I thought it's one less factor for a manager to try and not pick me so I want him to pick me on the basis of football and football only so now as you say leading on to Wembley and to know that I was there on the merit of my football and nothing else to it other than the merit of how I've done well in football was like a massive achievement for me any regrets in your career? In all fairness, I know I might sound mad, but I don't have any regrets personally because how my cards were dealt with, dealt to me, I got told I was probably lucky to be alive at 16 rather than have a career. So when I get told off a surgeon, you might never play professionally again. You might be able to have a kick around in the park with your friends, but you'll never play professionally. There might be a slight chance, but I'm not going to guarantee it. So for me to have a 10-year career after that, I can't sit here and regret anything because it's 10 years longer than any surgeon ever gave me or any doctor ever gave me. But if I'm speaking just from personal and what I wanted to achieve in football would have been to try and get a cap for my country. That is the only thing that I've... that like would have just topped off and I like if I had a retired this year but I had a cap for my country I would have easily said you know what I don't have a single regret but the only kind of regret that I would have loved to do would be to play for Ireland at a senior level and that's the only thing that I kind of think because I played in the championship obviously I could turn around and say I'd love to play in the Premier League but I think how everything was going and how everything is at the age of 28 and I was still in League 2 and things were going great for me yeah, I wanted to progress my career. But I think for what I achieved in my career, I was happy with. But I think the icing on the cake or how everything would have been would have been having a cap for my country. What what ultimately was it was it the task of of coming through another heart operation that ultimately led you to the decision to to hang up the boots? I mean, or was there a lot of other factors as well? Like I've had this magnificent ten or twelve year career, you know, I've achieved what I've wanted to achieve. And it's just time to close the chapter in that? Or, or was it strictly a health thing? It was literally strictly a health thing. Um, I, at the age of 16, I had two options for an operation. I had a mechanical valve or a tissue valve, like a pigskin valve. And the pigskin valve gave me an opportunity 
gave me a tissue and the mechanical valve meant I was on blood thinners for the rest of my life and you can't play contact sport with a blood thinner. So my, they were my two options. So I took the pigskin valve on the chance of saying, right, I want to give my career a chance. If it lasts me a year, I gave it a go. If it lasts me five years to what the doctor told me, like maximum of five years, I had a five-year career. So like I say, I've had an 11-year career, 10-year career, which is amazing. But then I've always said from the age of 16, when I need this second operation, I'm getting a mechanical valve and I need to think of the rest of my life because I don't want to be going through this two, three, four times in my life. Whereas I want to try and give everything for my career. And once that's finished and I, I have no regrets and I try to give it me all, my next step is mechanical valve and move on. So I always knew whether it was five years ago now or whether it was last year or three years in the future, whenever this next operation was going to happen, it was always going to be a mechanical valve and I was always retiring. So like I say, having 10 years, I was 10 years longer than anyone gave me. So I could have only had two year career and I still would have retired then. So I've just been lucky really. So you've retired, you're recovering from your operation. Uh, I've seen that you've done some kind of consulting work for um, Newport at various periods of time. I'm just taking my tablet here. Sorry. Yeah, no problem. Done. What, what's next for Mark O'Brien, retired footballer? Is it, is it coaching? Is it scouting? Is it nothing to do with football and going into business? I mean, what's, what's the future hold for OB? See, I always thought before football finished, I always had in my head, you know what, I've been around football for so long, I don't think I want to be in football after. But then when football gets taken away from you, football is all I want to do now. So I am hoping to look at doing some coaching badges this year, um, if possible. But also, when I'm helping or looking or seeing how people are working with analysis and how they scout people or how they go about things, that kind of intrigues me a bit more now as well, where I look at how these people, like the analysis person, and the manager and the coaches, how they work on scouting. I look at that and think, well, you know what? I'd, I'd go to watch games week in, week out to try and pick out players for people. Like, I'd love to do something like that. And then on every home match, I'm doing the home commentary for the I follow that's on right now. And I didn't think I'd ever enjoy commentary and I'm loving every minute of it. So, like, right now for this season that has only just come new of retirement, I'm trying all different experiences to know what to do and what I do like and what I don't. Because, like I say, the commentary really surprised me. I didn't, not not ever did I think I'd, I'd enjoy doing it or I'd like it. And I'm starting to really enjoy it. So, I think me for my future, I think I want to stay in and around football, whether that is helping in clubs, scouting boys whether that is to carry on commentary, whether that is to go into some sort of media side of football and, and to be able to do stuff like that. like that, That's the kind of angle that I do look at. But along the way, maybe like when I do start feeling better, I will want to like be a coach and be still in and around football because when it's all you know for the last 10 years, you kind of stick to what you know. And I was lucky enough to come across so many contacts in the game that have stood by me for the last 10 years that when I do be able to achieve all these different things and get coaching badges, I can always call on somebody and ask somebody for some help that I know that that, that they would help me in a, in, the, in a heartbeat. So um, I think for now is I'm just doing loads of different experiences. And like you say, I'm even like coming on podcasts and speaking out about things and a lot more people um, are taking an interest probably more now than they ever have because I'm coming out with stories that nobody ever knew about and I'm coming out with my life story that I only see as my life and other people see it as a story thinking I never knew he had this and because like you say I was always somebody that kept it all to myself so I think down media routes and staying in football in whatever capacity that I can is is, is a way that I'm looking at right now and I'm really enjoying but I think for now where uh, 
I'm in a little comfort zone just enjoying what I'm doing. But I think in in the rest of the year leading into the Italy running at the end of the season, I'm hopefully going to get some badges done. And then, like you say, once you have them, let's see where it takes me. And of course, you've got your end of season um, to put the boots back on and, and do a little bit of light kick around with the lads at Newport as well, Mark, to look forward to. Exactly. And, and, and that's something that, like I say, I had to set myself a little goal. And even the physio tried to set me a goal saying, right, well, if we're down 30 minutes of three and a half, four K of walking and jogging, he said, right. He said, by the end of this, he said, oh, we're going to do a five K continuous jog. And he said, it might take a few months, but he said, we'll do it. And I was like, nah, we'll never get there. But then after my last jog that I'd done, I was, I was feeling a lot better. And I was thinking, do you know what? I can do this. So now that's another little goal I can get myself towards. And like I say, because of the career that I've been in, setting little tasks or little goals or a guideline to follow, I feel so much more comfortable rather than trying to do it all myself. So I am lucky and privileged in a way to have these people around me, but also uh, on the other side of it, like it, I'm back to a comfort zone of, of knowing I've got a schedule to follow now and I need to do it. Well, Mark, you've been more than generous with your time. Um, I've learned, no I've learned so much uh, from you and it's, it's been really incredible to hear your story. And I'm really happy that, you know, that first of all, you're safe and you're healthy. You know, that's, that's the number one paramount thing, but I'm also happy for you that you've, you know, you, you're content with your football career and you're looking forward to the next phase of your life. Cause I think it's, a, it's, it's an amazing thing. And I'm really happy that, you know, you've started to share your story because your story is pretty amazing. And like you say, it's just your life. It's just the story of OB, but for us, for us on the outside and for us fans and, and people who do podcasts and things like that, and just people who just generally, you know, enjoy interviewing and things like that, you've got some amazing stories. And to be honest, the things that you've gone through, Mark, are very inspiring um, for, for a lot of people. And I've sat down with a lot of people and done a lot of different interviews for, for this podcast and in my profession as well. And, and what you've been able to achieve in your career and what you've been able to, to do is, is very, very inspiring from someone who's had, like you said, a different deck of cards dealt in life, you know, to, to be able to go on and, and achieve what you've been able to achieve is fantastic. And your positive outlook and your mental, um, you know, resiliency for these things is, is truly all inspiring. And I really, I really enjoyed this, our time together. And I hope we can chat again soon, but I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed it. Thank you. Yeah, no, that's perfect. Like, like I said, I enjoyed it. And the more that, like, like you say, like to speak again on another time where I could be at a different chapter, but it's something where now people are probably seeing all the stuff that I kept in for so long that they started to like realize that there was so much more to it than me just being the footballer. Like, I, I had like so much more on my plate along the way, but when you have football, and like you say, some people aren't lucky enough to have what I've had along the way, but. I'm sure other people have interest that they can kind of get themselves through things. And as you said before, like I've never seen it as a story or I've never seen it as an inspiration. I've just seen it as this is the life I've lived. So now that when I'm able to express that and speak to people like yourself and be able to like kind of get that out there and just speak open and honestly about like the life that I live, like there's like, I, I don't add anything to my stories or I don't try and make things sound a lot worse and a lot more grim to make the story sound better like I just speak and say it is what it is and like I said like I'm, I'm sometimes I've always got caught up in I've got caught up in trying to talk about the hard stuff so much that I enjoy stuff like this now even at the same time to be able to sit and speak about the career that I had and be able to reminisce and remember all the good times and remember like the games that I played and remember all the clubs I've been at and remember that like I played over like 200 odd like league games and that in itself is a great achievement to play 200 league games whether I've had bad cards dealt to me or not so the fact you can kind of toy both of them in together I'm able to just sit and explain it and speak about it and like I said I really enjoyed it.